Hello, and welcome to the Sarcoma Foundation of America's panel discussion, Genomics in Sarcoma. My name is Dean Freilich, and I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs at the SFA. We are glad that you have joined us for what promises to be a very informative session. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly go over the format and logistical details of this webinar. I will be serving as the moderator for today's session. We have four panelists who will give a brief background on what genomic testing is and how it is done, the current role of genomic testing in the diagnosis and or treatment of sarcoma, and current clinical trials investigating if this technology will be more useful in sarcoma treatment in the future. After their presentations, we will have questions and a questions and answers session. I will ask the panelists questions submitted by participants. At any time during today's session, you can submit your questions by entering them in the questions field. Our panelists will not be able to answer questions related to your specific medical situation, so please make sure that they are related to the topics raised during the session. The information contained in this webinar is intended to be for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician about your specific situation. Today's session is being recorded. The discussion will be archived and a link will be posted to SFA's website. Lastly, as a reminder, all participants are muted and any questions or comments can be submitted through the webinar's question portal. An important part of our mission at Sarcoma Foundation of America is to provide educational opportunities to help empower the sarcoma community. Now I would like to introduce our panel members. Dr. Andrew J. Wagner is the Associate Chief Medical Officer at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Medical Director of Adult Ambulatory Oncology. His clinical interests include soft and bone sarcomas and gastrointestinal stromal tumors. His research focuses on identifying critical pathways necessary for these tumors to form and survive, and in developing novel therapeutics that he tests both preclinically and in early clinical trials. Dr. Mark Levani is chief medical chief of the medical of the molecular diagnostic service and William J. Run uh, chair in molecular oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. His research focuses on the genomics and molecular pathogenesis of sarcomas and lung cancers, looking to uncover potential diagnostic biomarkers and treatment targets using next generation molecular techniques. He co-directs Memorial Sloan Kettering's Genome Data Analysis Center and helped develop the MSK Impact Tumor Genome Sequencing Test. Dr. Rashmi Chug is Associate Division Chief of Clinical Services, Division of Hematology Oncology, Sarcoma Program, Clinical Research Team Co-Leader, and Professor of Internal Medicine at the Rogal Center Cancer Center at the University of Michigan. She specializes in soft tissue and bone sarcomas and desmoid tumors. Her research focuses on clinical trials of investigative agents or novel combinations in sarcoma patients. Dr. Myrna Gounder is a medical oncologist and holds dual appointment in sarcoma and early drug development programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He specializes in developing new drugs in cancer with a specific focus on sarcoma. He specializes in personalized medicine where genetic testing of cancer is used to inform the right therapies for an individual patient. He is also the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Physician Ambassador to India and Asia. Again, thank you to the panelists for joining us today. I will now hand it off to Dr. Wagner, who will provide the first presentation today. Dr. Wagner. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Great pleasure to be with all of you. Let's go full screen. Um, uh, really happy to be here and, and participate in this symposium. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what gene sequencing is uh, to help kick this off. Um, it's a little bit on the basic side, um, but happy to address more specific questions later. Um, these are my disclosures. I have no uh, activities related to gene sequencing themselves. So. Uh, just as a really basic background to uh, genetic alterations in human tumors, um, we have uh, things called genes that are located on chromosomes. And chromosomes are large pieces of DNA that are within a cell. Uh, normal cells have 
two copies of each chromosome, uh, except for the sex chromosomes where there's either two X's or an X and a Y. Uh, and thus we have essentially have two copies of every gene. And the genes themselves code for proteins <clears throat> and those proteins control uh, the function and behavior of cells. And in particular, in relation to tumors, we're uh, concerned about things such as proteins that make cells grow, make cells survive or die, uh, make cells differentiate into functioning uh, tissues, uh, or um, lead to other um, uh, normal processes. And that's what genes normally are controlling. Genes are very tightly regulated uh, in terms of how they're expressed. Uh, they're turned on and off in a very coordinated manner. Uh, and the amount of a gene uh, that's expressed and the amount of proteins expressed is also very tightly regulated. Cancer cells, though, have alterations in the genes uh, and that can change their function uh, or the expression of proteins. Uh, and there's many different types of alterations and some of them are listed here. Mutations are abnormalities in the sequence of letters that for, of chemicals that form a gene. Uh, you can think of this as sort of letters in a word and a mutation would be a misspelling of a word or a word that is inappropriately truncated. Deletions are where regions of a chromosome, which can include one gene or multiple genes are actually deleted from that chromosome and just don't exist anymore. Uh, and obviously if it doesn't exist, it can't be expressed. Uh, gene amplifications are when a region of a chromosome, which can contain one gene or multiple genes, has too many copies. Instead of the two copies, one on each chromosome, there can be hundreds of copies, and that often leads to uh, overexpression, overproduction of the protein products that the genes can encode. Uh, and translocations are events that can occur when genes from two different regions uh, on a chromosome or from two different chromosomes are inappropriately brought together. Uh, and that can create uh, a, a new gene altogether or a, uh, a new type of protein, we call it chimeric protein or a fusion protein, uh, or it can change the expression of genes so that they are turned on when they shouldn't be turned on, or it can lead to inactivation of the gene. Those translocations are, are sort of like taking a word from two different chapters of a book and putting them together uh, and changing um, the meaning of that word. All these different types of mutations can occur within cancer cells. Uh, and together they can lead to the uncontrolled uh, growth of those cells or inappropriate survival of the cell when the cell should be uh, otherwise uh, dying. Now, over the last couple of decades, there's been an incredible advance in technology that allows rapid sequencing of genes. Um, back when some of us were in, in graduate school and early training, uh, this was a very manual process. Um, it could only be done one gene at a time. And even, even at that point, it was difficult to even know what all the, all the genetic sequence was. With the discovery and the, the, the sequencing of the human genome um, now a couple of decades ago, um, and a really rapid increase in technology, um, this has become much more efficient. But when we're looking at human tumors themselves, one approach is just to test the genes one at a time. Uh, and this can be when you ask a very specific single question. For example, uh, if you're looking at a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, does this have a KIT mutation? And you can sequence uh, KIT or the relevant portions of the KIT gene, which might contain mutations. Or you can look at certain tumors like the differential liposarcoma uh, and uh, with a technique uh, called fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH, where you can look to see how many copies of MDM2 might be there, a gene that's commonly amplified in liposarcoma. Or you can use FISH, uh, that fluorescent probe uh, approach, to look to see if a gene is inappropriately translocated, as the SSX genes can be in synovial sarcoma. And there's a number of these different examples in different sarcoma subtypes, which have very characteristic alterations. Um, uh, some of these almost define the tumor type, and I think we'll hear more about that um, from Dr. Ladanya in the next in the next presentation. And again, this is a, a, a good approach, uh, a feasible approach, if a very specific question is being addressed or being asked. What what is now kind of funny in a funny way called next generation sequencing, even though it's been around probably for 
generation um, is where you can sequence hundreds or even thousands of genes at a time. Um, and this is uh, due to a whole bunch of advances that have occurred over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. One is the uh, technology developments that allow to sequence millions of fragments of DNA at once. Another is the ability to um, map the fragments to panels of genes. Uh, and this allows you to determine the sequence variations, um, so alterations in the, in the, the chemical constituents of the genes, uh, changes in the copy number, a number of copies of the genes, and uh, identify select translocations. And this uses uh, software uh, that's also uh, facilitates this process. It requires expertise of, of uh, molecular pathologists to curate and interpret these results and annotate them to help us understand, are these meaningful changes um, or are they genes that are altered just for the go along for the ride that have no significance in the tumor itself? Uh, they're either normal variations that we see in, in, in healthy populations or they may not have any role itself in the human tumors. Um, and then the availability of these tests varies uh, depending on whether it's through a research or a uh, clinical test. Uh, those are often available at academic centers um, or uh, now they're also available through commercial labs that can be billed to insurance or to individual um, uh, patients who, who are able to pay out of pocket. The, the technology is summarized on the right, which is uh, DNA from the tumor, a tumor that could be from a biopsy uh, or it could be from uh, a surgical specimen that um, the pathologists have already analyzed and, and done the testing that they wanted, they, that they needed to do. Um, that material then can be, um, the DNA material can be extracted from that tumor. It can be fragmented. They can add little linkers to the side of it and then put it through a machine basically where um, the, the DNA can then be captured uh, onto uh, very specific um, uh, probes that are uh, in this device uh, it gets amplified from very small numbers of copies to, to millions of copies uh, and then sequenced through an automated sequencer. Um, and then that uh, output can be interpreted uh, to show us where there are alterations compared to a normal genetic sequence. Um, and that, that's really the process that's taken all these different steps on the left, the technology, the software, the expertise, uh, and the testing facilities uh, that have really uh, dramatically expanded the ability to do these types of testing. So we really have this scale of testing um, that goes from single gene to small panels of genes to panels of hundreds of cancer-related genes. And these are the more typical gene sequencing panels that are run today. Uh, we also have the capability to do what's called whole exome sequencing, which, which looks at the protein coding areas of all the genes, so 20,000 genes, or something called whole genome sequencing, which is sequencing not just the genes that code for proteins, but all the surrounding genetic material as well. Um, this, and each of these leads to increasing amounts of information, uh, but also increasing cost, uh, increasing time to complete these analyses, and increasing complexity of the data that comes back. Most of the, the, the sequencing that we're talking about is at this level, the panels of hundreds of genes that are implicated in human cancers. Um, so we're asking questions which say basically, um, here are 500 different genes that are known to be altered in human cancers. Are any of these altered in this particular specimen? So I just wanted to show you a few examples of what this looks like. Um, so these are some actual reports um, from patients. Um, th this is uh, a pathology report or a molecular diagnostic report from our institution where we, we do these in the context of research study, which is why it says for research use only in the background um, we do use these now for clinical use. This is an outdated report. You can see it's from four years ago um, where we are now allowed to print it. Um, but we can see, for example, this is a, a reflection of the numbers of copies across the, the 22 uh, chromosomes plus the X chromosome here. And where there are these, these blips that go up a little bit higher, the extra copies. And where there are these areas that are lower, these are loss of copies of genes. And we can also look to see, are there variants, these altered sequences that may or may not be important in the biology of the tumor? So this gene, TP53, for example, is one that is characteristically altered in many human cancers. Uh, and this tumor uh, is, has alterations in this gene. Some of the alterations may not be so important. Um, this is one that is important. 
um, but there are others that may not be. Um, and then we can also see things such as uh, uh, gain or loss of, of the numbers of copies of these different genes, uh, or in some cases, loss of both copies of the gene shown here. So this one is a relatively few numbers of alterations that are reported in this tumor, but a similar tumor type um, shown here has a, another alteration that's one that we can now target with medications, um, and, and then a whole bunch of other alterations that go on for several pages. Um, and so it's pretty complicated then to sit, sort through this and say, okay, which of these might be important uh, versus which are ones that um, are, are not so important right now for this. Some of it's tumor biology, and some of it, some of it does give us insight about how to treat the tumors. So an important question, which I think will be a lot of the discussion we'll have later uh, in the session is whether or not to do the testing. I think for research purposes, absolutely. Um, this is something that yields us lots of information about the diseases uh, and understanding of, of the biology behind them. For clinical purposes, it's, there's a lot to discuss about this. And again, we'll talk about it. The yield in sarcomas tends to be low, but there are some specific examples where it can be quite productive. We don't always know if the targets that we're finding are valid in sarcoma, that these are really therapeutic targets. And the cost of testing is still quite high. Um, the um, results can be dramatic though, when other options might be sparse. Uh, and we might make individual choices in patients that where it might be more beneficial to do a testing based on the tumor type uh, of the patient or what other options the patient might have. Uh, and in many cir circumstances, but not all, the insurance uh, will cover the cost. Um, I, you know, my, my general feeling for this is that I, I prefer to do the research testing. We do have opportunities uh, in my institution to, to offer this to most patients through research. Um, if we can bring the cost of the test down or increase the yield of testing, then I would do this in virtually every patient. Um, I think we're still at the point though where the cost is high and the yield in sarcoma is relatively low. Um, if we can select certain tumors though, which have a higher likelihood of finding uh, targetable mutations or, or excluding those where we know what the mutation might be, um, that will let us be more selective in, in how we choose this. And as I mentioned, I think we're gonna have a lot of discussion about uh, how we, 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 we choose to use this, this type of testing. Um, and it's really, I think, just a beautiful example of how uh, a collabor uh, collaborative efforts and, and advances in technology, which was absolutely necessary in research to understand uh, what the genetic alterations mean uh, and how we can um, apply them to patients and in clinical use and how do we determine how to use these tests in patient care. Uh, all lead to advances in how we can take care of patients with sarcoma. So I'm gonna end there uh, and turn it over to Dr. Ludanya. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was an outstanding introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful to Dr. Wagner for making my, my, uh, my life easier. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so you, you've heard about uh, the advantages uh, and the use of large-scale molecular profiling uh, using next-generation sequencing. And the, the usefulness of this kind of profiling is um, there are different um, uses and applications in the, the two broad categories of sarcomas the so-called simple karyotype sarcomas. So those sarcomas that have specific chromosomal translocations, and those come in two flavors. Uh, in one uh, class of these uh, translocation sarcomas, uh, transcription factor genes are involved. And, and this includes you know, major sarcomas like Ewing sarcoma and synovial sarcoma. Uh, whereas in other translocation sarcomas, less common, uh, kinase genes are involved, uh, such as in the example of infantile fibrosarcoma and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. And we'll, we'll talk more about uh, new entities in this area. And then uh, there are sarcomas that are defined by specific gene amplifications. Uh, really, it's um, the most uh, striking example is uh, well differentiated, de differentiated liposarcoma where MDM2 amplification is 
seen in essentially 100% of, of cases. And then other uh, simple karyotype sarcomas are uh, defined by characteristic uh, kinase mutations. Uh, and that's the very special case of gastrointestinal uh, stromal tumors. Uh, in contrast, you have complex karyotype sarcomas. Uh, and these are sarcomas that uh, when you do a karyotype, when you look at the chromosomes, you see uh, many abnormalities in both the number and the structure of the chromosomes. Uh, major examples include uh, Lyme sarcoma, so smooth muscle tumors, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, myxofibrous sarcoma, and others. And these typically harbor mutations in uh, tumor suppressor genes, uh, such as uh, p53, the retinoblastoma gene, the neurofibromatosis gene, and others. So in these different classes of sarcoma, uh, large-scale molecular profiling can provide different kinds of information. So for translocation sarcomas that involve a fusion uh, of a transcription, transcription factor gene to another gene, uh, the identification of the fusion is um, the primary benefit is to confirm the diagnosis. And that is typically done most efficiently by an RNA-based uh, profiling for fusions. And I'll, I'll show you an example um, in a few slides. In some cases, it may also be useful to uh, do DNA-based profiling, which can also detect some of these fusions or can detect secondary mutations that can have, um, uh, that can define a higher risk uh, subsets of, of patients or even uh, potential therapeutic targets. Then uh, translocation sarcomas uh, that involve uh, a fusion affecting a kinase gene. Uh, so in these cases, uh, you might both be confirming the diagnosis in some cases, such as infantile fibrosarcoma, uh, and you're identifying uh, the uh, optimal kinase inhibitor to treat uh, uh, the specific sarcoma with. Uh, so for these, um, again, RNA-based profiling is the most efficient method. Uh, plus minus DNA-based profiling, uh, which again can detect a lot of these fusions. And then once uh, the patient is on kinase inhibitor therapy, it can um, also detect uh, mutations that cause uh, uh, acquired resistance uh, to the kinase inhibitors. So a secondary benefit then is uh, selection of second line therapy uh, in patients who've already uh, been, um, you know, uh, who've already responded to a first-line kinase inhibitor and uh, subsequently uh, progressed. Now, in other sarcomas, so mostly with complex karyotypes, uh, mostly lacking translocations, this is where perhaps the yield of information is, is the, the least uh, obvious. Um, uh, DNA-based profiling plus or minus RNA-based profiling may be uh, useful. Uh, in some cases, uh, minority of cases, uh, one may detect a mutation in a targetable kinase, uh, for instance, in embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas. Um, but this is rare, uh, except, of course, in GIST, where it's the rule. Um, or you might detect an unsuspected uh, kinase fusion, uh, which uh, is a new area uh, that is generating a lot of in interest. And by, um, of course, uh, demonstrating the, the absence of fusions and the presence of mutations in P53, RP, NF1, and so on, one can, in a way, confirm the diagnosis of these sarcomas as well as a secondary benefit. So uh, you've heard a little bit about the, um, the science behind uh, large panel next generation sequencing based assays um, and that they're available at large academic centers and commercially. 
So the um, assay that's available at our center is um, called MSK Impact. Uh, and we, we started testing in, back in 2014. Uh, currently it's a 505 gene panel uh, and it's able to detect uh, uh, point mutations, small insertions or deletions, changes in the number of copies of different genes, as well as select rearrangements. And it was developed in the research lab of my colleague, uh, Mike Berger. Uh, I'm skipping the detection of mutations, which is uh, um, fairly straightforward. Uh, and showing you here an example uh, of a, a sarcoma relevant example of a detection of uh, uh, copy number changes in the number of copies of specific genes. So this is from a 63 year old woman with a de-differentiated liposarcoma. And it shows, um, so that basically the, the genes that are tested by the panel are arranged here in chromosomal order from chromosome one to chromosome X. Um, and uh, above this line in red are genes that have extra copies and below the line uh, are genes where a copy is lost or both copies are lost. And it, it, since this is a de-differentiated liposarcoma case, um, we, we see this very high level amplification of the MDM2 gene, which is uh, uh, characteristic of this uh, sarcoma. We're also able to detect some um, gene rearrangements uh, at the DNA level. And this is just um, a reminder that it, when uh, genes uh, rearrange uh, between different chromosomes, uh, the, the rearrangement occurs um, in a, a portion of the genes called the introns, which are between uh, the exons. The exons are the, the pieces that actually encode the protein. Um, and so these exons um, can be uh, sequenced and one can look for uh, pieces of DNA where one end uh, maps to uh, an exon from one gene, an intron from one gene, and the other end uh, maps uh, to an intron from another gene, uh, providing evidence that there's been uh, a rearrangement fusing the two genes. And uh, we're able to do that uh, for uh, uh, many different genes. Um, the ones in yellow here are genes that are relevant to uh, sarcoma fusions. Um, so here's an example. I, I, I won't go through the, the nitty gritty, but um, an example of detecting a EWS WT1 fusion in the desmoplastic small round cell tumor. Um, and just take my word for it, these, these colored um, uh, blocks here represent individual DNA molecules where one end of the molecule uh, is uh, mapping to EWSR1 and the other one to WT1, providing evidence of a, a junction uh, between the two. Uh, and that is uh, not present in, in the same regions uh, of the normal tissue. Likewise, uh, we can detect the EWS fly one fusion of Ewing sarcoma. Again, the, the colored blocks are uh, pieces of DNA that have been sequenced that have one end that maps to EWS, uh, EWS the other one maps to FLY1, the most common uh, fusion partner of EWS in Ewing sarcoma. Uh, the problem is though that um, as, as many of you know, the, the, the spectrum the, of different fusions in sarcomas uh, keeps growing. Um, we've identified the fusions in the major common sarcomas, but many, many additional fusions have been identified in uh, rarer types of uh, sarcomas. So it, it has really become um, impossible to 
look for these on a, a gene by gene basis. Um, so we're able to pick up some of them at the DNA level, but we can't pick up all of them. Um, and for the more technically uh, minded uh, among you, the reason is that uh, we, we cannot, there's a limit to the size of the introns that we can sequence efficiently in a uh, targeted uh, DNA uh, NGS panel. Uh, so not all fusions can be detected by a genomic DNA capture based method. And this applies to our assay, it applies to foundation one, uh, any uh, purely DNA based assay. The main limitation is uh, the length of these introns that, that are involved in these fusions. So the solution, of course, is a targeted RNA-seq assay. Uh, ours is called MSK Fusion. So MSK Fusion uh, is a targeted RNA-seq panel. Uh, it's based on the Archer anchored PCR uh, methodology. It includes 85 genes involved, involved in common uh, fusions in uh, solid tumors. And it's really a, a test that's either complementary or con confirmatory in relation to DNA-based fusion detection. So uh, because of its design, it allows the detection of any fusion involving one of these 85 genes, regardless of the, the gene that that gene fuses to, being regardless of the fusion partner. And we published our uh, experience with that uh, a few years ago, um, uh, and also identification of uh, a novel fusion in the process. Now, identifying fusion is, fusions has gotten um, clinically, you know, therapeutically a lot more um, uh, hot uh, with the realization that um, there are sarcomas uh, that don't look like they're going to have uh, kinase fusion, but they do. Uh, one of the earliest reports was uh, from uh, 2015, this patient who had uh, an N-track fusion in what was an undifferentiated sarcoma, 41-year-old woman. Uh, it had a LMNA uh, N-track 1 fusion, and uh, the patient had a, a very striking response to uh, NTRAC inhibitor. Um, so we're also able to um, detect these fusions uh, at the DNA level, for instance, by MSK impact. And here's an example of a 61 year old woman with uh, an unclassified malignant spindle cell tumor that had an NTRAC1 fusion. And the NTRAC1 uh, IHC was also positive uh, in this case. So we know the story of NTRAC fusions as a, you know, a, a pan-cancer target for uh, NTRAC inhibitors. This was the uh, original study um, report uh, for the uh, clinical trial of larotrectinib um, that was um, run by two of my colleagues. Um, and Importantly here, um, many of the patients uh, indicated with arrows. So the patients indicated with arrows are the sarcoma patients. And they included not uh, just the uh, type of sarcoma that is expected to have uh, a fusion, such as uh, um, inflammatory fibrosarcoma, but also many uh, other soft tissue sarcomas uh, that did not fall into that morphologic category. And this has, I, I did not bother putting arrows on, on this one. This is an update of the larotrectinib clinical trial data, uh, again, showing uh, many uh, patients with soft tissue sarcomas uh, who had NTRAC fusions responding uh, very well to this therapy. And this has triggered um, a, a kind of a, 
a, a re revisiting of the morphology of these tu tumors to try to see if we can recognize them morphologically. Um, and these are some examples of papers that have tried to, to define a, a morphology for these, these tumors. Um, and here's a, a review that uh, looked at these uh, entities, these sarcoma entities that are defined by kinase fusions. Um, you've got the classic infantile fibrosarcoma here and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. So those are two types that we already knew had kinase fusions, but the other subtypes uh, we did not know uh, that they had kinase fusions. And we, we didn't know because nobody was testing for it. And the kinase fusions are very kind of uh, inter interchangeable. Uh, you can see uh, that the same players reappear uh, in, in multiple different uh, uh, types of sarcomas uh, with these fusions. Um, we've recently seen um, a patient with uh, a child with a, a renal tumor that had a RET fusion who responded to a highly specific RET inhibitor. Uh, this uh, was just published uh, uh, a few weeks ago in cancer research. So I think you, you can begin to see um, the, the pressure or the interest to uh, make sure that we don't miss these uh, kinase fusions. Um, one other thing that I wanted to highlight also uh, that's just coming up now is in translocation sarcomas, um, we have rarely detected um, in uh, sarcomas that uh, have a fusion involving a transcription factor gene, we have rarely detected um, additional mutations in uh, targetable kinases. Uh, for instance, FGFR4 in desmoplastic small renal cell tumor uh, and uh, more recently FGFR1 in Ewing sarcoma. So, I think I'll, I'll uh, stop there and um, uh, be happy to take questions either in the chat or uh, at, during the question periods. So, and I will uh, pass it, pass the baton to Dr. Uh, Chuck. Chuck. Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, so much. It's going to be hard to follow those two fantastic talks by Dr. Wagner and Dr. Ladanier, but I am going to kind of focus a little bit and I'm going to share my screen here um, uh, on just one aspect. You know, we had a nice broad overview about genomics in general and, and how genomics are being used more and more. I'm going to focus a little bit about how we use genomics in diagnosing sarcomas. Um, so this may or may not be relevant to you or, or your loved one, but it can be very important as we think through how we can use genomics for, for patient care. Um, okay, this is just my disclosures, um, nothing related to genomics. So to start, um, you know, as you all know, sarcomas can appear in many different ways. There's over a hundred different types of sarcomas or histologies of sarcomas, and they can really occur anywhere in the body, you know, ranging from the heart to the leg to the mouth, um, and really any place you can imagine. They can also occur in any age, um, and trying to figure out, you know, how best to treat a patient is really um, trying to understand what type of sarcoma they have, um, which we usually accomplish with a biopsy. So um, when we do a biopsy, we, we look at the tissue under a microscope. Um, and unfortunately, when we look at the tumor under the microscope, sometimes it doesn't always give us all the answers. As you can see by the various biopsies of the sarcomas we just looked at, at the, on the last page, there's different patterns and different colors and stains based on the type of sarcoma it is. Um, sometimes over time, these cancer cells can lose their, their pattern or lose their stains and make it hard to figure out what type of tumor they started from, what cell they started from. 
And in order to best treat you, the patient, you know, we have to kind of try to put this puzzle together. Um, and sometimes there's some missing pieces and, and we can use genomic sequencing at times to kind of help figure out what type of tumor we're, we're seeing and how best to treat it. So what I'd like to do is give a few examples of some patients that, that have been treated that really genomics has, has played an important piece of um, the puzzle for their diagnosis. So this is just a few examples. This is a, a first patient is one I treated relatively recently and is a 36 year old man that had a painful thigh mass and, and then was found to have a lung mass. So he initially developed some pain in the back of his thigh that was worsening over time. Um, we did a, there was an MRI that was performed and showed about a four centimeter mass that in one of the thigh muscles, and that was breaking into some of the bone causing some pain. Um, and a biopsy was performed and it came back um, likely representing an epithelioid sarcoma. I first heard about this patient when I was um, called from an emergency room up in the Upper Peninsula in, in Michigan saying that, you know, we have a patient that you're slated to see that has some chest pain and has a diagnosis of an epithelioid sarcoma and we did a CAT scan and he's got a large lung mass. So, so when, we, when we meet patients, we try to see if we can put the whole story together to, to make sense of the best treatment plan. And, and sometimes when we, when we have a diagnosis and we have a patient, it doesn't always fit together. So when we talk about when do we use genomics, as Dr. Wagner was starting to allude to, when is the right place? Um, in this case, the patient, there was some red flags that kind of came up. So, so the tissue and the biopsy that we had from the thigh was pretty limited. They, they, they kind of thought it represented an epithelioid sarcoma, but they, we weren't able to do all the stains that we usually would do to try to confirm a diagnosis. The, the tumor in the lung was very big for what we might expect. Um, and, and oftentimes when we see something in two different places, we, we often want to prove that we know it's the same thing and, and try to understand the tumor a little bit better. So what we often do is we do a biopsy or biopsy prove a site that we're concerned of for spread. So because there were some questions as to how the diagnosis, what the diagnosis was, we decided to do a lung biopsy with some genomic sequencing. Um, so this is an example of um, you know, as, as Dr. Ladanya mentioned, each university has their own program, um, oftentimes, um, uh, of doing sequencing studies. So we did an initial biopsy, and we made sure there was enough tumor in the biopsy areas. And the initial diagnosis, again, was an epithelioid sarcoma. But then when we did additional genomic testing, we saw that the genes that it was expressing was quite a bit different. So when we, when we did some special gene testing, um, uh, we look, it looked like the genes that were being expressed seemed to be more consistent with a tumor that was of lung origin rather than a tumor that was a sarcoma that started in the connective tissue. This is a series of tests that we use that is called the tissue of origin and cancer type predication. So it, it helps us basically predict what type of tumor, um, what type of cell the tumor is coming from. We also did the same type of testing that was um, uh, mentioned earlier, where we look at the number of gene copies. Um, and this tended to have a lot of copies of a gene that's often found in lung cancer. And then we looked at all the genetic changes or what we call mutations that were seen in the tumor. And this tumor had a very high number of mutations and the number of mutations, uh, the types of mutations we're seeing were the types that are often seen in tobacco smoking. So to kind of put this all together, this is an example of a report that we get um, after we've had genomic testing done in our, um, in our center. Um, and it looks for, you know, was there any types of, you know, pathogens or infections? Were there any types of hereditary variants? 
Um, was there any types of fusions, as Dr. LaDonia mentioned? And then what is the gene profile? And overall, um, you know, as evidenced by some of the genes expressed, the mutations, the copy changes, and the signature that was seen, we concluded that this wasn't a sarcoma. And that was because there were some clear red flags that told us that we should do some genomic testing to kind of help put, put this patient together. And in this situation, the diagnosis and the treatment was dramatically altered by genomic sequencing. So this is just one example of the role that, that um, genomic sequencing can, can play. Um, I know Dr. Gounder is going to talk a little bit more in how it can play in a role in therapies as well. Um, the next patient that I wanted to talk to you about briefly is another patient that I saw several years ago um, that was 45 years old and had a kidney mass that looked very much like a kidney cancer. So he went on to surgery, which would be pretty standard. And that surgery was, was removal of the kidney, ended up showing what we called an undifferentiated malignant neoplasm that favored an undifferentiated round cell sarcoma. Now, just so you know, um, you know, undifferentiated round cell sarcomas, we often treat with pretty aggressive chemotherapy to tr try to prevent it from coming back. Now, when the, when the diagnosis is not certain, and as you can see, when, when a di diagnosis is favored as opposed to definitive, you know, that brings some question as to what, are we doing the right thing? Do we know what we're dealing with? So in this situation, we also performed some genomic sequencing. And the result was um, kind of doing those same types of testing we were able to find, and in this case, I'll point you to this gene fusion, which is something that Dr. LaDania mentioned, um, is that we found a gene fusion that really was characteristic of a specific type of sarcoma that was not an undifferentiated round cell sarcoma. So this um, was actually a diagnosis of something called a solitary fibrous tumor, which is another type of sarcoma, but it's treated very differently. Um, and its natural history and prognosis is very different than what was suggested by the initial pathology. So this is kind of just another example how that testing can be helpful and the diagnosis and the treatment was dramatically altered by genomic sequencing. So we, we did a series looking at all of our patients that were sequenced at University of Michigan to try to better understand what the role of that sequencing is. Um, the, the, um, this was for all different types of cancer patients. And I know we have some data probably coming up about sarcomas specifically, but it's interesting to note that in about 80% of patients, we found some type of information. Now that's not every patient and some of that information we already knew just from standard testing. But the thing that was important as we talk about diagnosis, in 55 patients who we didn't know the exact site where the tumor started, we were able to find the site in about 50%. And four patients had their tumors completely reclassified, and two of those patients were patients with sarcoma. So you can understand there's quite a bit of information we can get from these. Um, the last patient I wanted to, to touch base with you about is another patient that had a um, leg and a liver mass. Um, this mass was biopsied and it came back as an unclassified sarcoma. And our pathologist said, well, this might be a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. So oftentimes we often treat patients with sarcomas that start in the soft tissue similarly at first. And we went through some of our standard treatments. And then as hopefully many of you guys recognize that oftentimes we like to use clinical trials to treat our patients. And some of those clinical trials require classification of a sarcoma. So in this situation, um, we had clinical trials that were um, available for patients with two different types of sarcomas that this could be. And so we went ahead and did genomic sequencing to try to see if we could classify this tumor better. Um, we did the genomic sequencing and found several different genomic changes. And I went back to my pathologist and I said, hey, you know, I've got this additional information for you. Um, can you help us classify this sarcoma further? 
And essentially, to, to summarize, we got a very lengthy explanation that, that went through all of the changes that we saw. Um, and I promise not to read this to you all, but the bottom line is that no flip further classification was possible. And, and we really weren't able to do any specific treatment based on the molecular sequencing available. And, and so I thought it was important to show you yet that there's examples where it can be very helpful with diagnosis and treatment, but unfortunately, sometimes we don't get any additional information. So, so to kind of summarize um, in terms of when we're looking at genomics and, and sarcoma diagnoses, um, you know, as you know, as we talk about, sarcomas are complicated. They're heterogeneous, they can appear in many ways, and it's oftentimes difficult to make the correct diagnosis under, by the microscope alone. And targeted or full genomic testing can help us make a diagnosis, and we really should kind of consider it if the diagnosis isn't very clear or if it doesn't fit the usual picture. But unfortunately, it doesn't always give us the answer either. So, you know, it's important to get the right diagnosis so we can help with treatment decisions. So in certain situations, this is a key part, it can be a key part of your care. So now I am going to respectfully sign off and allow um, Dr. Gounder to take over here um, to talk more about, um, oops, this. not share my screen anymore so we can talk about um, the treatment options that we learned from, from these tumors. Okay, thanks everyone. Can, can you, hold on, let me. Bruno, I think you need to switch your display settings too. Okay. Does that work? Does, it, does that look okay? We can't see your screen. Not showing yet. Can you see the screen? No. Not yet. No. Okay, let me try it again. Can you see it or no? Not yet, Bruno. No. Can you go back to the way you had it before and then just switch the mode, the presentation mode? Yes, no? No. Okay. Is that coming through or no? No. It's very strange. Okay. Maybe if you share your full screen, that sometimes helps. It's very strange, okay. Yes, no? No. Can you see it now? No, we cannot. That's very strange. Okay. Mm. In, in the meantime, um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, where, you know, where can patients work with their physicians in, in requesting a, a, a genomics test like this? And then once they get them, um, if, if someone could add, uh, expound on, you know, what, what do you do with the information that you get? So, so I, you know, I can, can speak to that. So genomic testing is available in a lot of different ways, as, as mentioned. It could be 
if you're at a major academic research institution, sometimes they have their own programs. You can also um, get it from commercial laboratories. And, and most oncologists are familiar with obtain, how to obtain genomic sequencing the best way in their, their area. So you can you ask them about um, you know, what, they, what venue they prefer and what's accessible to them. And then in terms of how to use the information is really important to talk with your oncologist to help you interpret the reports. You know, we went through a lot of reports pretty quickly, but, you know, they can be difficult to interpret um, and understand, you know, how clinically useful that, that information is. So kind of a partnership with your oncologist is the best way. I just add that the reports that each of us showed um, were our institutional reports and the reports that come out of some uh, commercial places are, are more simplified. Uh, they often also suggest clinical trials, which, which may not be relevant necessarily. Um, so it is important to discuss those with your, your oncologist about the appropriate approach uh, and how to interpret the information in the context of your particular disease. Myrna, have you have you? Uh, been yeah, I just sent I just sent them to you. Um, okay. Sorry, it's usually never a problem. Um, I, there was another question in the meantime. Uh, so. You know, how, how can patients uh, support this kind of research that you guys are, are discussing and research that you're, you're doing currently? Well, I, go ahead, Roger. You... <laughs> well, well, I will say, well, th you know, um, thank you so much for that question, first of all. You know, it, it's always, um, just so touching to, to have patients that are in that this situation to ask how they can help us. You know, we, we're really doing this to see how we can help you. Um, but, you know, I think getting involved with organizations like the Sarcoma Foundation of America and other advocacy groups to see how you can support research is, is great. It's all, you know, we, we all showed kind of our institutional series and, and some of that comes from funding from the government, which is challenging and some of it comes from philanthropy and that allows us to do a lot of our work. Andy, I'll let you jump in as well. No, I agree and I think if the question were, was, was specific to uh, research related to genomic testing, I think you know talk if you're at an academic institution or you're, if you're, if your oncologist is colleagues at an academic institution, I think it'd be great to see how you can share your tumor samples with them or, or if you've had DNA testing, genomic testing already performed, if you can share those results with them too, if, if they have a database, for example, where they can collect that information and, and it just helps us understand more about the diseases. Um, it, it is, I, I totally agree with what Rashmi said, that it's, it's incredibly generous if anytime patients are are interested in participating in research or contributing to research. And, and we always, uh, you know, obviously appreciate it. This is how we learn. This is how we improve our, our understanding of the diseases and treatments of the diseases. Dean, are you able to see my slides now or no? Unfortunately not, no. Okay, let me try once more. Okay. Let's see if I can go in and... Uh... Find any more questions that? Nothing. Unfortunately, no. Okay, I sent you the slides, maybe, you know. Yeah, I, I haven't received them quite yet. It's very strange, okay. Can you go back to where you were, the, the initial uh, one that you had, that, you, that we were able to see? 
Are you able to see anything now? No? No. This is super strange. Okay. Renaud, you, are you, you using your monitors? Yeah. Are yeah, you I do. Monitors? Can you switch your monitor? Can you drag it over to the other monitor? Yeah. Exact, my exact thought. And stop sharing, reshare, and see if that works. Any luck? No? Oh. This is so sorry. Uh, this is... Do you want to? Yes, you... no. Don't you uh, don't use presentation mode. Just just go through the slides in in slide sorter mode. Okay. Does that come through? No. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. This is. Um... Dean, I just sent you the slides. I don't know if you, if you. Okay, let me check again to see if I received them yet. You know, two years of using Zoom, you would think <laughs> this, this would be pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> While we're waiting to see if um, the slides get fixed and Dean works on that, there's been a couple of questions about the difference between genetic testing and genomic testing. Um, can you talk about that a little bit for, for the participants? Well, um, yeah, we kind of often use the word two terms interchangeably, um, but the implication with genomic testing is that it's uh, broader testing of multiple genes, uh, more of the genome, whereas genetic testing can mean testing of just one gene. Um, so that's kind of the way the two terms are used, but it's a, it's a bit loose. So um, I think what we've been talking about mostly on this webinar is uh, what most people call genomic testing, which means a uh, broader um, uh, testing of multiple genes in, in a given sarcoma. Can I add also that the um, we've been talking really today, and, and Mark, you might want to comment on this more about the testing that you're able to do, but we've been commenting mostly about testing of the tumor tissue. Uh, not for things that would reflect uh, an inherited risk for developing uh, cancer or for passing that on to uh, children. Um, there are other tests that can be done on normal cells that look for that. Uh, and sometimes that information can also be extracted from this type of testing, but not in most of the standard testing that we're, we're talking about. And I don't know, Mark, if you want to comment more specifically about that. Yeah, no, it's it's a very important point to make um, that the testing that we've been talking about is what's called somatic uh, genomic testing, meaning looking for genetic changes that are only present in the tumor cells and not in the normal cells uh, from the patient. Um, there's a whole other discussion to be had about uh, what's called germline uh, genetic testing to look for uh, mutations in your uh, in your normal cells that might be predisposing to uh, sarcoma. Um, and major ones being uh, germline p53 mutations, germline NF1 mutations, uh, and other you know less common uh, uh, situations uh, such as that. But it's, it, it's really a, a practically a, a topic for a separate uh, uh, webinar. Um, although I should say that uh, many um, people are now, patients are now choosing to have both done at the same time um, 
especially if, if you're a young patient with cancer, it, it does, uh, it is um, reasonable to, to look at whether there's a cancer, a sarcoma predisposition in your uh, normal cells. So it sounds like from the pre presentations thus far, um, in terms of subtypes where it'd be most beneficial maybe to get the genomic sequencing is GIST and liposarcoma. Would that be true or would what is the benefit to patients? And, and as briefly, since we're um, at 805, um, when is it most beneficial for patients, especially if insurance doesn't cover it, um, to get genomic sequencing? Well, yeah, GIST is in its separate category. Um, it's really uh, part of diagnosis and management of GIST to get uh, sequencing. Um, and for um, the translocation sarcomas, um, it's become standard of practice at least to, to get the confirmation of the presence of the translocation, like in the Ewing sarcoma to confirm that there's a EWSY1 translocation so that the, the diagnosis is, um, you know, established without uh, doubt. Um, and then the other, you know, benefits that we've been talking about are kind of, you know, lower down the list. And it's a question of, uh, as, as Dr. Um, Wagner said, um, you have to balance uh, cost and benefit. And um, it's, it's um, uh, you know, I think at, at the large academic centers, we, we tend to, to um, uh, um, place more emphasis on the benefit, uh, but um, obviously the cost is an important factor as well. Yeah, I would add that I, I, you know, we're at the academic centers, we're spoiled by having pathologists who have a lot of experience with sarcomas. Um, and they very commonly can make the diagnoses based on their experience of seeing literally thousands of, of these very rare care cases that um, pathologists outside of academic settings might see a, a few times in their career. Um, Dr. Uh, Chug showed us some examples where they were baffling diagnoses. Uh, and those are, are, those still happen even in academic settings. Um, I'd say for, for many of the tumor types, uh, it, just like many other things that pathologists like Dr. Ladani used to, to diagnose tumors, um, it's based on a constellation of different things. It's not just based on a molecular test. It's based on other factors, like what does it look like? What's the location, like Dr. Chuck was saying? Um, what are the other stains that uh, are present? And then this can be used to help confer the diagnosis or help narrow down the list of things it could be. And in those rare examples, like, like Dr. Chuck was mentioning, where it can help uh, point to a different diagnosis or a more, or more precise diagnosis, but there are other situations where it, it doesn't add more information. I think as far as from a therapeutic approach, I think this is what Dr. Gunder was going to talk about. Um, there are some tumors where we, we have a very good idea of what the drivers are, where there's some tumors where we know it's very unlikely that we're going to find a a mutation that we can target with a drug. Um, uh, and there's some like in liposarcoma, as Brandy just mentioned, uh, in D-differentiated, blood differentiated d difference liposarcoma, uh, we, we know what we're going to find with the genomic testing. It's very unusual for us to find something unexpected in those tumor types. Um, so I don't know that there's a lot of value in doing genomic testing for routine clinical purposes for, the, for that tumor type. Uh, unless it's to help make the diagnosis. Um, but so there are some sarcoma types or some, some more uh, tumors where, where we just were looking for additional help uh, to find a treatment approach um, where the genomic sequencing might help give us some insight. 
I, I, there, there's a variety of studies. Dr. Chug mentioned some, Dr. Gunder is probably about to tell us about some, um, where there are different percentages that are reported for how likely it is to find an alteration that's targetable. Um, our experience here is that it's, it's low um, in sarcomas. It's, it's, it's generally unusual for us to find a mutation that would change the way we would treat a tumor, but it does happen. And, and that's where it comes back to that yield and cost ratio. If it's, if it's cost a million dollars, but we can detect it in everyone and it changes everyone's treatment, I think it makes a lot of sense to do it. Or if it costs a dollar uh, and we only detect it in one in percent of patients, I would test it in everybody. Um, but it's sort of like, where are we in terms of our expected yield and, and what's the cost of the, of the test? I think um, Merle was gonna to talk to us about that though. It looks like we made it work. Oh, is it working? Yes. Yeah. Woohoo! All right. You know, I'll I'll rush through these slides. Um, okay. So I won't change anything. All right. So you know, let me let me hopefully this will. Work. Okay, great. So what I'm going to talk to you about is um, a recent study that we conducted in collaboration with uh, Foundation Medicine. This is a company based out of uh, Boston. Uh, that does a lot of these next generation sequencing. And this is not endorsing uh, foundation medicine or really any commercial company. There are many companies that do a great job. This is just sort of a research study that we did and sort of the findings that, that have come out of it. And to really get a question, sense of like, well, what is the use of doing these next generation sequencing in the sarcoma clinic? Are we helping our patients or not? So in this study, we looked at 7,500 patients who had sarcoma who underwent next generation sequencing of their tumors. And the reason, the, there were multiple reasons that uh, physicians who were treating them did it. We think that most, most of them did it for the purpose of trying to find a target to help their patients uh, to find the right drug. Um, and that we, most, most likely. So, this, these 7,500 patients with sarcoma really comprised the whole range of all the different sarcomas that were sequenced. The most common were sarcoma not otherwise specified, meaning that we really didn't have a good sense of what they were, and down all the way to these really, really rare sarcomas like chordomas and granular cell tumors. But about 44 different types of sarcomas were represented among these 7,500 patients. So the first question, and this is sort of in, uh, you know, a seg to reinforce what Dr. Chug had spoken in her, uh, in her uh, topic was, can this next generation sequencing help change the sarcoma diagnosis? And here is, you know, I won't get into all the details, but here's the top line. We found that 11% of all sarcoma diagnosis had some kind of mistakes. And, and the case, the three cases that she uh, showed is, is, is not these are not oddities. These are not rare things. These happen pretty commonly that even in the hands of expert sarcoma pathologists, there's constantly a debate about, is this the right diagnosis or not? And, you know, there's a lot of things that go into how to make the right diagnosis. You know, you obviously have to have the right clinical history, the right story, the location of the tumor, what it looks like under the microscope. And increasingly and thoughtfully, one has to use these molecular tests. And next generation sequencing is, is one of the tests that is, that, that's also used. So among these 7,500 patients, what you see here on the left-hand side is what's known as original pathology. This is what the, the, the pathologist had initially thought this diagnosis was when it came in. And then what happens is all of these tumors underwent genetic sequencing and just based on some very characteristic translocations. I mean, these were very clear molecular signatures where it was unmistakably a different diagnosis, these patients got reclassified. And this is 834 patients out of the 7,500 patients who were sequenced had, had the wrong uh, sarcoma diagnosis or the wrong sarcoma histology. This is not to say that it was not a sarcoma, but some other lung cancer, but rather among the 50 or 60 different types of sarcomas, it turned out to be a completely different histology. And increasingly, these things do make a, a, a very important, um, it, the, the, the diagnosis, the specific type of diagnosis does matter in terms of which clinical trials patients can enter into. So 
looking at the whole spectrum of all 7,500 patients, similar to what Dr. Chug had found at University of Michigan, this foundation medicine research collaboration that we did found that about 31% of all sarcoma patients under, had some kind of a genetic alteration to which some kind of a drug uh, could be applied to. And when you look at this black here, that's the one with the least amount of evidence where the evidence is not super strong. And wherever you see green, the evidence is really strong that a certain drug uh, uh, will help, and the purple is somewhere in between where the evidence is somewhat in, in, uh, in, in between. So here's an example. I know we briefly talked about GIST. Um, when you look at all the gastrointestinal stromal tumors, I mean, this is really the poster child of targeted therapy. And we've known this for 20 years that, that certain types of GIST are the ones that respond to uh, imatinib or sutant and, and other drugs. But right now, if a patient with GIST had a surgical resection the, the, and, 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 and it met other criteria for being on imatinib or, or Gleevec, uh, we would put most of those patients on for three or five years of Gleevec. But we also understand that there's a subset of patients who are not going to respond and are probably going to needlessly get um, Gleevec for a prolonged period of time. So in those patients, upfront genetic sequencing, whether it's PCR or this next generation sequencing, uh, can really help avoid uh, Gleevec-like therapies for a, for a long period of time. So again, this, this uh, and then here's this big red pie called PDGFR D842B. These tumors don't respond to the current drugs at all. But recently, as many of you may know, that the FDA approved a drug known as avapritinib. In order to get avapritinib, you need to prove that there is that the tumor, especially this GIST, has this mutation PDGFR and DA842B. So the next generation sequencing seems to be a very convenient way of getting this information uh, to put the right patients on the right drug. So this is GIST. And we're going to move on to the rest of the sarcomas because GIST is pretty unique and, and you know, and there are a lot of nuances to this itself. One of the questions that a lot of people have very frequently is immunotherapies and sarcomas. So um, if you just looked at the question of who could possibly benefit with immunotherapy and sarcoma, I want to show that there is this, there was in back in 2020, the FDA approved this drug pembrolizumab, also known as Keytruda, for adults and children with tumor mutational burden that is high across all solid tumors. It really didn't matter what kind of cancer you had, whether it was sarcoma, carcinoma, melanoma, it didn't matter. If you had something known as a high tumor mutational burden, and this high tumor mutational burden was really defined as anybody with greater than 10 mutations per megabase. If you had that, you, the FDA, you could get pembrolizumab because the FDA has approved it based on that indication. So looking at these 7,500 patients uh, in this research study, we asked, well, among all the sarcomas that we look, looked at using next generation sequencing, how many have high tumor mutational burden? And we found out that close to 4% of all sarcomas, 4% have, have a TMB of greater, greater than 10. And if you made the threshold even more stringent, that the number came down to about 3%. But really 4%, four out of 100 patients have a high TMB across all sarcomas to which the FDA has already approved pembrolizumab for those patients. And there's no other way to get this information besides doing next generation sequencing. Um, and here's an example. Here's a patient of mine who failed lots of therapies and then had still had a lot of disease. Turn, we did next generation sequencing, turned out to have a high tumor mutational burden went on uh, immunotherapy, and as you can see here, is basically cured uh, from his uh, sarcomas. Here's another patient, also had a TMB of greater than 20, uh, failed a number of prior therapies, as you can see here, went on uh, Keytruda, but this patient had a TMB or tumor mutation greater than 20, and as you can see here on the scans here, this red area has completely disappeared, and here it significantly shrunk as well. So nice response in patients, but Again, this, these are anecdotes, not to mean that every sarcoma patient is gonna respond, but it's certainly a, a clue as to something that we can certainly try for patients. The FDA also granted uh, approval for this pembrolizumab in something known as a high MSI or microsatellite instable, MSI high. So we looked at how often is MSI high 
in, in these 7,500 patients, and it turns out it's exceedingly low. So it's less than 0.1% of all sarcomas have high uh, MSI. But tumor mutational burden, which is different than MSI, uh, is significantly high, which is about 4% uh, of uh, these TMPs. Next, kinase fusions. And Dr. Mark Ladani had spoken uh, about these kinase fusions in sarcoma, which a fusion basically means two genes coming together and basically turning the, the tumor on. So across all sarcomas, among 7,500 sarcomas, we found that 3% of all sarcomas had these kinase fusions in these fusions in ALK, NTRAC, BRAF, FGFR, ROS1, and FGFR2. Uh, and for every one of these, these targets, there is an FDA-approved drug, maybe not necessarily in sarcomas. I think for NTRAC, sarcoma certainly fall in the category, but for ALK and BRAF and FGFR, uh, they, we have, uh, FD, have FDA-approved drugs already in specifically for fusions, which turn out to work out work quite well. Um, here's, here's a patient, as Dr. Ladani mentioned, this is one of the initial studies, young patient who came in basically with soft tissue sarcoma, not otherwise known. As you can see here in this scan, just riddled with, with sarcoma from head to toe. And then incidentally found to have this NTRAC3 fusion went on this drug larotrectinib and had a complete response for almost five years, at which point he did have a genetic mutation. I'll talk about that shortly. And Dr. Ladani already mentioned that this is this drug larotrectinib for NTRAC fusion positive solid tumors, really any cancer, it doesn't have to be sarcoma, really any cancer that has this NTRAC fusion, these drugs turn out to work uh, very well. Uh, similarly, BRAF. BRAF is another gene that's also in fusion for which a drug called vemirafinib, and there are other drugs that also target this fusion are also available. Now, and here's a patient who initially had a wrong diagnosis and then the diagnosis got changed to this BRAF fusion uh, sarcoma, went on this drug and had a nice response. As you can see here, a lot of these dark areas starts to disappearing. So again, the key thing I wanna emphasize is 3% of all sarcomas do have these kinase fusions. And for almost all of them, there is an FDA-approved drug, not necessarily with an indication in sarcoma, but, but there are FDA-approved drugs. So what are the next steps? There are a lot of new drugs that are even sort of the next generation of drugs that are even better than some of these FDA-approved drugs that are all in clinical trials. But here's the thing. If you don't know, if you don't do next-generation sequencing or some other way to discover what kind of a fusion you have, you can't enter any of these studies. So this is for NTRAC. Uh, this is for FGFR. There is a drug note by the name of rogaratinib. Uh, here's for ALK and ROS. There is re repotrectinib. This is a even a considered like the next, the second or third generation drug after larotrectinib and entrectinib. And similarly, there's these other uh, next, you know, um, uh, new, new molecules in clinical trials, but all of which one must know uh, whether you have the right uh, kinase fusion or not. Next, what, I'm, what you're looking at this is known as a heat map. A heat map basically says, well, looking at all these 7,500 tumors, which are the most common genes that are, that are mutated? And the number one mutated gene is this gene called uh, P53, followed by RB1, and then CDK and 2AB, MDM2 and CDK4. Now, quickly, just talk to you about a couple of the cl current clinical trials uh, that are open. The first thing I want to say is that P53 mutations are currently not targetable, except for one very, very rare mutation in P53 known as Y220C mutation. And there's this clinical trial with this drug, which appears to be, um, you know, at least in preclinical work, it seems to be. Uh, uh, a good target only for this mutation. So if you if somebody has a P53 mutation, but it's not this mutation, uh, this drug is not going to work. And there's really no other studies that I'm aware of targeting P53. Uh, I had shown that there's these two other molecules called uh, genes on a CDK and 2 and B. Right sitting right next to it is a gene known as MTAP. So generally when people have deletion of CDK and 2A or CDK and 2B, there's another gene known as MTAP that also gets deleted. So if that deletion happens, there is this clinical trial that's currently ongoing. We've been doing this for uh, almost two years now and open at many other sites. There is this, in, it's, it's a gene known as MTAP. It sits right next to the CDK and 2AB gene. 
And if that's lost, the MTAP typically also happens to get deleted as well. And there's this clinical trial called AG270, uh, uh, which would be, um, which is, I'm not saying it's, it, these are all, these are all clinical trials. So we're evaluating whether these drugs would, would, would work. Um, so the point is that if one has these mutation or, or loss of MTAP, this would be a study for which it would be required for one to enter in. And next we'll move on to this uh, MDM2 and CDK4. We briefly talked about this and many of you are already familiar that MDM2 and CDK4 are two genes that are highly, highly amplified in a disease known as D-differentiated liposarcoma. Um, and, and here's a study that uh, uh, you know, basically ended up uh, uh, sort of an important data point to start a phase three study in D-differentiated liposarcoma that is just, that's open, that's uh, accruing across the, across the world. But for that study uh, in just D-differentiated liposarcoma, you don't need to do a next generation sequencing, just having the diagnosis of D-liposarcoma is enough. And that's the study currently going on from a company called Rain Therapeutics. But here's the other thing. If you look at this, you clearly see a big signal of MDM2 in D-differentiated liposarcoma. But what you can see here is there is this faint signal across many other sarcomas as well. And you certainly see here in osteosarcoma, here in bones and, and other types. So there's a faint signal that in, in some patients, MDM2 is amplified. And so what do you get for those patients? So for those patients, there's a second study, which is known as a basket study with the same drug MDM2 inhibitor, uh, as long as you have a high amplification of MDM2, Patients with any other sarcomas, uh, really any other cancers can enroll into the study. This is also from a company called Rain Therapeutics. It's known as Mantra 2 study. That is currently open and accruing as well. Next here is another gene known as TSE2. And this is a study led by Dr. Wagner uh, that uh, recently uh, resulted in the FDA approval uh, of this drug known as serolimus uh, uh, that is protein bound. So when the FDA approved this drug, they said, you know, as long as you have this disease known as perivascular epithelial cell tumors or PCOMAs, you can get this new drug that has just been approved. So, but there's a new study that is looking at what if you had these TSC2 or TSC1 mutations across any cancer, even across any sarcomas. There are other sarcomas that may have a TSC1, TSC2 gene mutation that may not necessarily be a PCOMA. Though for those patients, to, if, you're, if you know to have a TSC1, TSC2 uh, mutation, you can certainly enter this phase two basket trial with this drug. Next, I'm gonna move on to IDH1. So IDH1 gene is another gene that is frequently mutated in a bone sarcoma known as chondrosarcomas. And there are many studies and I've just highlighted one. Uh, here's a study from a, from a drug company called Lilly where if, if patients with IDH1 or IDH2 mutations can enroll, and certainly this is a very, very good option for patients with chondrosarcomas, uh, which have a high degree of IDH1, IDH2 mutations. Recently, we saw this study with a vaccine in chondrosarcoma as well. Uh, there, is a now, there is a study that has just opened up with the same vaccine, but in order to enter that study, you need to know whether you are, do you have an IDH1 mutation or not? And if you're wild type, you can still enter it, but the study does require you to know the status of your tumor. And lastly, and this is my very last slide, I'll stop right now, <clears throat> looking at uh, desmoid tumors. So in desmoid tumors, there's a gene known as beta-catenin that is highly, highly mutated. So historically, or even now in the NCCN guidelines, if somebody is newly diagnosed with desmoid tumors, we tell them, look, you need to get a colonoscopy. And if you get a colonoscopy, in order to rule out another disease known as FAP. But it turns out that if you do like genetic sequencing or some other mechanism by which you can sequence desmoid tumors and it's confirmed that you have a beta catenin mutation, you don't need to get a colonoscopy. This is good enough to rule out uh, a disease known as FAP. Um, and my very last thing um, is something known as homologous repair deficiency. And this is, uh, Sarcomas, about 15% all of them have a very high, um, sort of the, the, the DNA itself is very crumbled or shattered. And there's a new study that's about to open, it's not yet open, where if you have mutations in these genes that contribute to this genomic scarring, 
uh, you could qualify with a PARP inhibitor such as Olaparib. These are drugs that are already approved in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm, I'm sorry, I was not able to share my slides uh, properly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gounder. And, and with that, uh, we'll need to wrap up our session. Uh, thank you to Drs. Wagner, Ladanyi, Chug, and Gounder for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your thoughts and expertise. We appreciate all that you do for the sarcoma community. And, and I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today to be a part of this discussion. As a reminder, today's session was recorded and the link will be posted to SFA's website within the next few days. You can find SFA online at www.curesarcoma.org. We have also posted information for future education sessions on our website. But this now concludes the discussion.